This is the second part of lecture 18. The first part was sex and hormones with a focus on sexual reproduction and also the role of sex hormones in aggression. Now we're going to be talking about hippocampus and memory. So a pretty abrupt transition, uh, but you know, yeah, you could think of some connections, but eh, anyway, so yeah, we're gonna, why don't we get into it? Um, there's a lot to talk about with the hippocampus and memory. This lecture is gonna be relatively short and it'll be followed up with a second portion on the hippocampus, which will be um, an entire lecture because there's a lot related to the memory and the hippocampus is a really important part of the brain. So memory is something that can be categorized into a couple of different types and a lot of it really based around the time frame for retention. So we're gonna talk about that in this slide here. So the first that we're gonna discuss is immediate memory. So that's right here. This is the first part of memory. And it's the um, it's it's really the thing that's ongoing and the experiences and information that you are perceiving at that moment. The visual, auditory, and tactile experiences um, they are held in your mind for fractions of a section, a second, um, or um, or a few seconds actually. So any ongoing experience that you're having, if you are immediately asked about what is going on or what just happened in those previous couple of seconds just about any kind of thing that was described or occurred, you could recall that. So our ability to recall things that happened seconds ago is actually quite good. And it would be across all sensory modalities, visual, auditory, tactile, the combination of, the, of, all, of all of them. Then we have working memory after that. So this is the, the um, type of memory that is on the order of seconds to minutes. And this is what we refer to when we are holding on and using information and keeping it in mind in order to achieve a goal. So let's say um, your phone is in the other room and someone tells you their phone number and you might, okay, I, I need to remember your phone number so I can put it into my phone so I don't have to remember it. So let me just repeat it a couple of times. You say it a few times and then you run into the other room and you type it into your phone so then you can uh, put down the phone number. That's working memory. So um, holding on to any kind of information for a brief period of time that you won't necessarily need to retain long-term. That takes us to long-term memory, which is where we retain mem information for days, weeks, or even across a lifetime. So information that is very significant um, to us in the immediate or working term or working memories, they can enter into long-term memory as rehearsal um, via rehearsal or practice. Uh, so let's say um, I really wanted to memorize your number. I might, instead of just repeating it a couple of times, I might repeat it 15, 20, 30 times. And then doing that and practicing it, it's likely to be consolidated into memory, into long-term memory. Um, so the thing is, uh, long-term memory is just going to really retain the most important information. Um, the information that is transferred from immediate term memory to working memory and then, um, and then to long-term memory, there's loss that happens at each stage. In your long-term memories, you will not be able, as, as, as long as it's like days or weeks or especially a lifetime later, uh, months and years, there's no way that you would be able to recall all of the sensory, auditory, tactile information that was happening right at that moment with great accuracy. Um, yeah. So how do we form long-term memories? Um, that's a very big, important question, a central question to psychology, philosophy, and neuroscience. Um, and the, obviously, as from the neuroscientist perspective, as well as others, that it, memories have to be encoded in the brain in some way. The brain is a physical structure and there's got to be something happening physically within the brain in order for that long-term memory to exist. We refer to that physical embodiment of a long-term memory as an engram. So the memory itself is the memory, but whatever the physical structure that it took to, to hold onto that memory is referred to as an engram. There are physical changes that happen in quote unquote brain wiring, say a change in the effic efficacy of synaptic connections, 
changes in NMDA to AMPA ratio, growth and refinement of synaptic connections, so you can get new synapse growth. Um, any of these things, these are these are just some of the features that we know that are critical for the formation of memories, especially long-term memory. So this is a slide we've seen already, and we've talked about some of these memories. The procedural memory, um, what's referred to as skeletal musculature, cerebellum. There's some memory processes there that we kind of uh, didn't discuss in great detail, but we talked about the cerebellum. Uh, and then we just briefly went over some of these other things. So we're going to talk about this slide in more detail now. So memory can be put into two main categories. Um, we have declarative memory and we have non-declarative memory. Declarative memory can be further broken into two additional categories, facts or semantic memory. And then there's events or episodic memory. So the way to keep these things straight is that, you know, if someone's arguing semantics, they're arguing about the details of certain facts, right? So that's semantic memory. And then, uh, you know, if you're watching an episode from a TV show, it's clearly going to be a series of episodes in a row. They're going to be telling a story that's going to go in a, a, um, a series of events. And that is episodic memory. So that's how you keep those two things apart. Then non-declarative memory um, uh, is that that you can't really state and describe very easily, like you can recall facts and events. But to, you can describe out procedural memory, of course, but you're, what you're doing is you're remembering the, uh, basically the episodes or facts about the procedural memory. The act of doing it, it doesn't involve declaring it, right? So that's uh, the striatum, and that's going to be those series of patterns of, of, of following some sort of procedure that allows you to produce some sort of motor output. And then there's um, emotional responses. The amygdala plays a very big role in that. It's not the only thing. The hippocampus plays a role as well. But we will talk about that later. So we're going to focus mostly about the, the role of the hippocampus currently on declarative memory, and in particular about episodic memory. So one way of testing episodic memory in animals is to do what's called a spatial memorization task. So you've probably seen pictures of mice and rats running through a maze and they do it enough times they will remember the uh, where they are precisely through the maze, right? So that's one form of a spatial memory task. There are ways of setting it up so that it can be different and we'll explain some of those nuances in the next slide. But one of the most commonly used forms of a spatial memory task is called the Morris water maze. So this works for rodents. And what you do is you have a, a testing room where you've got a big old bath or maybe a tub with a, uh, like a, a, a pool of water. And usually it's cloudy. Usually it's pretty milky so that the, the mouse, let's just say mice, they can't see inside the water. But they can see outside of the water. They can see certain features of the room, that there would be like a chair here. There'd be a... Uh, you know, this sort of checkerboard thing here and a yellow triangle thing here. So these are features that the mouse can use to orient itself to know that, oh, okay, something is going to be, you know, I know where I am in the bath because there are these features. So the, the next part of the bath that the mouse can't see because it's submerged is that there's a small platform that is hidden underneath the surface of the water and the goal is for these mice to learn where this small platform is located. So mice, they, they don't like to swim. They can do it. They can do it pretty well. But they don't really like to. They want to be not swimming. And so they will swim around and around and around when the very first time that you do this. This is the first trial. So this rat, okay, so we're going to talk about rats. They're swimming. This this rat is going to just be swimming and swimming and swimming, trying to get out, but it can't because it's it's a little too high up on the sides. But eventually it's wandering around and it finds this hidden platform. And then it's going to get up on that platform so it doesn't have to swim anymore. It takes a long time for this rat to do it. And you can me measure this using a video camera above the, the bath. So watching the rat go around and around and around, and eventually it gets to, to the platform. 
If you do this enough times and you've leave the platform in the same place, the rat will go directly to where the platform is because he has learned that um, where in space the platform exists relative to the features of the room. Let's say the platform is right here. He knows he's got to kind of swim over towards where this red checkerboard thing is in order to find the platform and that the yellow triangle should be over here and that the chair should be over here. So the rat has learned the spatial configuration of things and has learned where it needs to swim in order to get to the hidden platform. So this is a test of spatial memory and they get better and better at it after you, you do it enough time. So you can uh, see them learn in real time. So it's a great test. So I wanted to briefly talk about the role of the striatum in regulating procedural memories. Um, it plays a role in and can be tested in what would superficially seem like a hippocampal dependent memory. But in fact, um, it's actually they're following a simple procedure. So let's walk through the different ways of doing this. So there's, there's something called the standard radial arm maze. Um, in this, the way they've set this up is that every arm is baited. Okay, so got a little bit of cheese in here for this little mouse. And he's going to start in the middle. And um, in the standard radial arm maze, what happens is that this is, is testing a declarative memory. In order to be efficient, the rat or mouse needs to remember which arm it actually went down. So uh, if this is a, uh, the dotted line showing the path that the mouse took, you can see that this mouse was very, very efficient. It went down each of the arms just once. So this mouse had a very good sense of like, oh, okay, I did this one. Oh, now I got to do this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. Very, very efficient. So this mouse likely knows this maze quite well. And it would have memorized the different arms that it, it had already gone down so that it didn't waste time going and try to find cheese where it doesn't exist. If you lesion the hippocampus before a mouse does this task, it impairs their ability to do this task. If you lesion the striatum uh, um, for this task before they've learned it, it really has no effect. They can learn how to do this task. But if you do what's called the modified radial arm maze, and in this case, what's happening is that the mouse has to learn that each arm that has a light on at the end of it has cheese. It doesn't have to really care about the location of the arms. Instead, what it's doing is it's following a procedure. It is learned the association of light plus food um, so that if there's light, you're going to get food. So it only has to look for where there's light. So it follows this procedure and it, and, and it can do this to find the food. So this is, follow, this is a, a form of a procedural memory. It's not a spatial memory. And in this case, um, it only has to follow a basic rule. Enter the lighted arms. And striatal lesions impair with this task, but not hippocampal lesions. So hippocampal lesions really don't have any effect, but striatal lesions will impair this task. And that's because the striatum also plays a role in associative learning with the whole dopamine reward and that it can create this procedure um, in mind that light equals reward. So this brings us to a little bit more of nuance in understanding these different forms of memory. Um, and here we're going to be talking about conditioned learning. So conditioned learning involves formation, strengthening, or weakening of an association between a stimulus and a response. So this is where um, the striatum can play a big role in this. So there are two broad forms of conditioned learning. We have classical conditioning, where two stimuli are repeatedly paired, a response first elicited by the second stimulus, eventually elicited by the first stimulus alone. So when you get when you compare when you have two stimuli that are learned, um, that uh, that one will elicit a response, and you compare it with the first one. Eventually, the first stimulus will do it itself. We'll talk about it in more detail in the next slide. And then there's also operant conditioning, which, again, we'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a couple of slides. So classical conditioning, um, the example that most people are familiar with, and it's a good example, is Pavlov's dogs. So um, a famous behaviorist, Pavlov, had been working on how memory works. 
and came up with this rubric of understanding of, of classical conditioning and how stimuli can be memorized. So let's just walk through a little bit of the Pavlov dog experiment. So before there's any conditioning that occurs, a dog is exposed to two stimuli. One is an unconditioned stimulus. And in this case, it is the sight or smell of food. So that's the US, the unconditioned stimulus. So it's a big old steak and it smells good and looks good. Dogs know this and they start to, to salivate. Mm. So it's called an unconditioned stimulus because this stimulus by itself can induce a change in the animal. Like it's inducing some sort of response. They're driven to want to get to this. Now, a conditioned stimulus is something that's completely unrelated to the unconditioned stimulus. So if you present both of these things at the same time, a ringing bell and the unconditioned stimulus, the animal is going to make a pairing in its mind. So seeing and smelling the food induces saliv salivation, but hearing the bell just on its own does nothing, right? So the dog hears a bell, okay, no big deal. So this is before you actually pair these things. Then you go through the process of, of, of pairing. The, so you repeatedly um, ring the bell every time the dog is shown a big juicy steak and it starts to, to salivate, of course, because there's a steak there. After you do this enough times, when you ring the bell, which you know doesn't necessarily have to bring a steak, and if you do it just by itself, the dog will start to salivate. You may have seen this if you've ever had dogs or cats. And, you know, as soon as, like, if, if you have a cat that, like, eats out of a, a tin can, and as soon as you go into the kitchen and you grab, like, the, the, the can opener or you, you start making the noise of opening a can, sometimes, like, so I've got a cat and um, it eats uh, some, it gets wet food out of a can occasionally, and it loves it. But every time we open up any kind of can, he is in the kitchen and because he thinks he's getting some food. He has associated the sound of us opening a can, even if it's like for a can of black olives, he will be right there meowing, thinking he's going to get some food. He's been classically conditioned in exactly the same way. And you probably have seen this as well if you have pets. And you can even see it in people sometimes too. Operant conditioning is similar to classical conditioning. It shares some of the same features, but it's not exactly the same. There's some subtlety in the difference. So with operant conditioning, uh, what you have in this case is animals learning to associate a particular act or operation with a particular consequence. This could be a positive outcome, such as a reward, like giving some sort of candy or some juice, or a negative outcome, such as a foot shock. That is one type of negative operant conditioning that's used. There's a, a famous psychologist in the uh, middle part of the 20th century who worked on and developing the principles of operant conditioning. His name is B.F. Skinner. His experiments had taught that um, he could teach pigeons to lever press for food reward. So that was one of the first experiments to show this. And, that, um, and, and he did all kinds of experiments with all kinds of animals, including humans. This approach is widely used in many types of animals um, in a test apparatus that we now call a Skinner box. So this box will be outfitted with various environmental cues, such as lights, sounds, uh, speakers, and it'll, there'll be devices in there too, like levers or other things. Um, and then oftentimes there's a chute that'll give out like say pellets, little bits of food or say candy. Um, and then, um, yeah, so and the way this generally will work is that an experimental animal will just kind of come along, it'll be in the Skinner box, and it'll just touch the lever because, you know, kind of bored of just doing whatever. And then it'll learn, hey, wait a minute, let's say I touch this lever, I get some food. So after doing this multiple times and pushing the lever and getting the food, the animals then start to associate the two events. Hey, I push this lever, I get food. Yummy, delicious. This increases the probability of pushing the letter, lever for more reward. This is a form of, of operant conditioning. And it's dependent upon rewards and punishment. Negative, positive outcomes and negative outcomes. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the underlying neuroanatomy that's related to forming memories. We're gonna start with the hippocampus. In fact, we're gonna mostly be talking about the hippocampus um, from here on out for the next lecture and a half. First, what about the term hippocampus? Where does it get its name? Any of you guys know this? 
it's a weird name, hippo, like hippopotamus, hippocampus. Well, it gets its name because of its shape. So this is the hippocampus of a human dissected out of its brain. And you can see it looks a little bit like a seahorse. So hippocampus is the genus name for seahorse. Genus and species, right? Um, yeah, and you can see it looks well, quite a bit like a seahorse. I mean, um, and then uh, actually uh, there's a lot more interesting etymology around this. So hippo actually, you know, we know hippopotamus. Hippo refers to horse and campus refers to sea, seahorse. So a hippopotamus is a river horse. In fact, the Potomac River is called the Potomac River because Potomac means river. And so Potomac River is kind of river, river, I guess. I don't know. Okay, I'm rambling. Um, so yeah, hippocampus. The hippocampus is can be found in all vertebrates. Um, we're going to focus on mammals. And really, we're just going to be talking about rodents and humans. It is generally kind of located in the same area of the brain in both humans and rodents, but it's not exactly the same. So in humans, it is located along the temporal lobe primarily. That's where the largest portions of it are. And so it's a little bit more ventral in the brain, not really cut up towards the top, but a little bit more towards the bottom and, and kind of goes along the inside of the temporal lobe. So this is this is where you can see kind of located here. So this would be like the head of the of the seahorse and this would be the tail. And it's also right up next to the amygdala. So that's another portion, right, uh, to give a little bit more of a sense of where we're looking. Um, in coronal section, uh, it's located, so we have the, you would have the cortex going all the way up like this, right? Right here, this is the gray matter. And it's, it's, it's always, um, as long as you're looking coronally along this area here, you're going to find it really at the edge of the cortex. And so it's this, it's a series of layers that are located there at the edge of the cortex in humans. Um, in mice, uh, it's, it's actually located a little bit more dorsally. It's basically in the same location. It's on the inside of the brain, um, inside of the cortex, at the edge of the cortex. But in mice, it's, it's a little bit more dorsal. You can see that um, it's, it runs up a little bit more towards the dorsal side of the brain. The, bo both in mice and in humans, they have, when you start to look at the cellular connections, they're basically the same. They have a very, very similar overall cellular structure with three different layers that are important or three different areas that are most commonly described. Um, we have the, uh, we'll start with the dentate gyrus. So the dentate gyrus is like a C-shaped thing like this. If it's kind of a backwards C, depending upon which side of the brain you're talking about. If you're talking about like, uh, so this would be the, uh, if we're looking coronally, this would be on the right-hand side. If we were looking on the left-hand side, it would be this, but mirrored. And so we got the dentate gyrus right here. And then we have another C shape that sort of interlocks like this. So we have two C shapes that are interlocked. These are cell bodies that are located here. So we've got drawn in a cell body. This is a dentate gyrus cell, a granule cell in the dentate gyrus. And um, so these cells then are connected to the CA3 region right here. So these are pyramidal cells that are within the CA3 region. And then these neurons that are this portion of the CA3 region, they project to the CA1 region of the hippocampus that are also pyramidal cells. So we get a line of pyramidal cells. There's CA3, there is a portion called CA2, um, and then there's eventually CA1. But for our purposes, we're gonna talk about dentate gyrus, CA3 to CA1. Um, and we will also talk about these connections. This is a, a, actually a really nice diagram to study for the, uh, for the hippocampus because it has all these details. And the other thing that you can see is that they're all excitatory. There are inhibitory neurons that are like inter, um, like inter uh, neurons that are located here that do help shape how uh, information passes through the hippocampus. But the main connections we're talking about are all excitatory. Okay. So here's a little bit more detail of this location of the hippocampus in humans versus rodents. So in humans, like I said, this is the edge of the cortex. And then here's the hippocampus with its three regions, the, 
the dentate gyrus, CA3 kind of fits in the CA in the dentate gyrus, and then back over here is the CA1. And this is what it looks like in a series of, of um, uh, in the monkey and the human, you can see it's basically the same, right? Zoomed up. Um, in the rat, you can see um, still has the same interlocking Cs with the dentate gyrus like this and CA3 and then CA1 right here. And then it's mirrored on the other side. Same is true for the human hippocampus. We got... We have two hippocampi. There's one on the right, one on the left. Hey, and uh, as an aside, uh, you guys remember this? What is this? This is the lateral geniculate nucleus. See the different layers? Pretty cool. Right next to the hippocampus. So here's another um, diagram of, of the basic hippocampal circuit. It's actually a fair amount complex, more complex than this. Uh, but this includes the major synapses that are um, the best studied in the hippocampus. Now, the hippocampus has been widely studied because of its simplicity. The neurons are um, well segregated. They are um, easy to record from. So a lot of slice electrophysiology has been done in the hippocampus. Um, so, And there's been a ton of work on overall synapse plasticity within the hippocampus. And there's also um, uh, the fact that it's related to a very um, relatively uh, interesting behavior, memory. And, and so you can connect um, these, this relatively simple circuit to what is going on in, uh, in the brain and, um, and its impact on behavior. So let's walk through the circuit a little bit. The first is that it, um, information from the entorhinal cortex enters into the hippocampus via the perforant path. So um, the perforant path is as this connection here from the entorhinal cortex to the dentate gyrus, synapsing onto granule cells within the dentate gyrus or the DG. Those neurons synapse onto CA3 neurons via the mossy fiber path. So that's what this is called. This is the mossy fiber path. And then Schaefer collaterals from CA3 neurons, that's what these are called, Schaefer collaterals, synapse onto CA1 neurons. And then those pyramidal neurons that are in the CA1 region will then uh, synapse to a different region of the entorhinal cortex. So this is the, the basic pattern, uh, the, the simplest circuit through the hippocampus. It can get a little bit more complex so why don't we take a look at what that looks like? But this is going to be what. So there are these pyramidal neurons. This this is another diagram showing these neurons. You can see they got the, the triangle pyramidal shape in the CA3 region, the CA1 region. This is a little bit more anatomically correct of what these neurons look like. They have these big dendrites on both sides of the of this layer of neurons. Um, for the dentate gyrus, uh, they look um, similar, but these neurons are smaller, hence they're called granule cells. So you've got the pyramidal cells in the CA1 region, CA3 region, and you've got these um, granule cells. Uh, there's a little bit more level of complexity here, so you can see that there's portions of entorhinal cortex. This is called EC2 here, synapsing onto the dentate gyrus, but there's also some connections even into the CA3 region as well. And then here's the mossy fiber region. Um, and then here are the Schaefer collaterals onto the CA1 region. So you can see um, there's there's more circuit complexity to the hippocampus than in the previous slide. I don't expect you to have this memorized. I'm just showing this so that you can have a little bit more of an accurate understanding of it. Um, even in addition to that, there's local circuit interneurons. That's what these are where they will provide inhibition to portions of dentate gyrus to get uh, have a um, uh, little bit more regulation of the kind of information that makes its way into uh, through the hippocampus. Um, as an aside, the dentate gyrus is the only area of the brain that also undergoes neurogenesis um, in adults. So why don't we talk a little bit about what the effects of hippocampal lesions are on spatial memory? 
So I've already shown you this before, but let's walk through it briefly. On the very first trial, when you throw a rat into um, a Morse water maze, he's just going to swim around a whole bunch, swimming, 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 until he finally gets finds the hidden platform on accident, essentially. But over time, this rat is going to learn where the hidden platform is, and he will swim directly to it, regardless of where you put him into the back. He'll know that the, the, the hidden platform is located over here. When you do this with a rat that has hippocampal lesions, they never really seem to learn. So this rat will swim and eventually find the platform on accident eventually. But after 10 trials, it still is doing a lot of searching and not actually finding the, the hidden platform. This is what the data would look like, um, or it is from this study right here. This is uh, the citation for the study. What you can see is that on trial zero, the very first trial before they had done any kind of learning, that it took both groups of rats, whether they are hippocampal lesioned or control lesioned, around 50 seconds to, to finally find the platform on average. And then, but you can see pretty quickly uh, for um, trials two through six, the control rats were doing it less than 20 seconds. And then eventually it's doing it less than 10 seconds, super quick. With these rats that had the hippocampal lesion, you can see that they never actually learn. It usually takes them about 45 to 50 seconds to, to find the platform. So and this is, again, a nice illustration that the hippocampus plays an important role in spatial memory. So that is it for this lecture. All right. So there will be another lecture following up with more about the hippocampus. We're going to learn more about its role in spatial memory and, uh, and, and also some of the work that's being done here at Virginia Tech related to the hippocampus. But let's talk about some key questions. Uh, what are the types and categories of memory? Uh, what is the difference between declarative and non-declarative memory? What are the principles of conditioned learning? Uh, classical conditioning versus operant conditioning. What is the Morse water maze? Can you understand a graph of results from the Morse water maze? Okay, so this is going to test your graphing abilities. And then what, where is the hippocampus located? What are the major neurons and areas of the hippocampus and how are they connected to each other? So this is a circuit question. So that's it for this one. We will follow up with another lecture coming um, about just the hippocampus. So stay tuned for that.